Hello, my name is TJ McIntyre. I'm an associate professor here in the ECD Southern School of Law. And I teach and research mostly in the area of technology law and fundamental rights online. So for this virtual class, I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which the pandemic has affected fundamental rights in relation to what we do online and the way in which we respond to the pandemic itself. So we've all been forced to move a lot of our interaction online. And we've already seen quite a lot of privacy issues arising out of that. So Zoom, which you see pictured here in the background, has been one of both the worst offenders and also one of the organizations that's been quickest to begin to clean up some of the problems that it's seen. Zoom has had a, a series of criticisms that it hasn't provided adequate protection for individuals' privacy, that it doesn't encrypt video calls end to end, which means that its own employees or conceivably governments might be able to monitor what people do on it. It's been criticized for not having enough security to present Zoom bombing, where people break into Zoom chats and disrupt them. But they've also recently developed responses to that, where, for example, they have introduced greater use of passwords on um, Zoom chats to make it harder for people to get in who shouldn't be there. And they've also developed more end-to-end -end encryption, which means that the content of your conversations can only be viewed by you and not by, for example, their own employees. But the use of this technology creates a number of wider problems as well. So for example, there are issues there about the level of privacy we can expect as against your employer or even your university in relation to private chats which take place between people on Zoom calls. If you take part in a private chat and Zoom call, is there a risk that your employer, your university, might see the contents of that so-called private chat later on? So there are issues here with expectations about privacy in the context of online chat that simply don't come up when we look at privacy in the offline environment. And these are important things to bear in mind as we continue to be forced to use these products more for the time being. The second issue that has really been thrown up by the move online is the so-called digital divide, the problem that you might have a lack of broadband in your home, for example. So we've seen a lot of people in a university context, students and staff alike, who have found it difficult to do things because the quality of the broadband at their home, even within Dublin, never mind people in a more rural setting. They found that the quality of the broadband at home has been so poor that connections drop out, etc., which makes it for a lot of people impossible to take part in live video calls. And instead they have to, for example, phone in. So there's an issue here about equity in how digital resources are allocated. Not to mention, of course, the problem of having access to the devices that you need to um, access online services to begin with. So for a lot of people, that means that they only have phones rather than computers or tablets to use. For a lot of older people, it means that suddenly they've suffered a double whammy of being cocooned, so kept away from day-to-day -day interaction, but also they probably lack in a lot of cases the technology or the expertise that they need to make full use of the technology to participate in other ways. So one of the issues that we look at in the context of um, research and teaching in this area is the question of the digital divide and the kind of laws and policies we need to mitigate that to make sure that people have full access to broadband, et cetera, to, to consider whether internet access should be considered a fundamental right, to think about sort of law and policy responses that will make sure that people can fully take part in a digital society as well as a offline society. The third area I just wanted to flag up for you as an area where we see a lot of um, issues in this context is 
the idea of contact tracing. Now, you've probably seen reference in the news to the HSC rolling out a contact tracing app. And in the background here, you have a little diagram taken from um, Google showing the way in which contact tracing is intended to work. So as you can see there on the left, the idea is that if you talk to people, you're nearby people, your phones anonymously exchange identifiers with each other. And if one of you is then later diagnosed with coronavirus, the idea is that you can then securely notify other people that they might have been exposed to you if they've been in touch with you in close proximity for more than, let's say, 10 minutes or 15 minutes at a given time. And that enables them to get tested or uh, self-isolate as appropriate. Now, obviously, this is a form of mass surveillance. This is something which is only really going to be effective if it's taken up by a substantial proportion of the population. And it's something that creates real risks. If you think about the way in which logs of everyone's movements at all times could be used to identify and punish people. For example, people in the United States at the moment taking part in Black Lives Matters protests. So there are fundamental issues there around privacy and data protection law, the way in which these systems are designed, public expectations about how they might be used, how we make sure that those systems are shut down once the pandemic has passed. And in the area then of our teaching and research, we will be looking at issues such as um, how these types of applications can be used, how they can be protected against abuse, and the kind of social considerations we need to bear in mind when we're developing this kind of technology. So those are just a few of the types of issues that I work on that hopefully you'll find interesting as an example of how law can impact on the response to the coronavirus pandemic, particularly in the area of digital rights. And for more information on this, probably the easiest way to find it is to follow me on Twitter or have a look at my Twitter feed at TJ McIntyre. Thank you very much.